This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, this is a great day. It's not only a Thursday, it's a great Thursday. <laughs> okay, John David Ann, history professor at HPU, is joining us. We're going to call this Through the Lens of History, and today we're going to talk about the history of taxes, which is very important. And let me add that, you know, generation after generation, regrettably, they forget history. Right. And we have to remind ourselves, or we will repeat the bad parts. Um, so I really appreciate what you do, what you teach, and when you come down here, I really appreciate what you say. Oh, it's great to be on here, Jay. I love to come down here and talk about, you know, putting, putting contemporary current issues into historical perspective is so important because yeah. uh, we need to understand the past to understand the present. Yeah. Really. So, yeah. 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 yeah it's, and it's not only, it's not only um, having to relive it, it was George Santayana, right? <laughs> right, right, but right. It's, 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 we have to learn from it. We have exactly. to do better, not, not the same, not worse, but better. Exactly. That's why I'm here today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So today we're going to talk about the history of taxes. Right. Right. Uh, do you mean taxes in general in the world, or do you mean taxes in the United States? Taxes in the United States, of course. And of course, this has to do with the current tax bill that's before the Congress. Of and and uh, uh, and so thinking about taxes as something which really affects you know the everyday American completely. So uh, this current bill, you know, is going to take the country in a different direction in terms of tax. It's going to reward those with capital. Those who can form uh, partnerships and LLCs and C corporations are gonna benefit greatly with this tax uh, reform, but those who do not, wage earners, are gonna, in the short run, they'll probably see a benefit, but in the long run, they're gonna, uh, it's gonna be damaging to them because uh, somebody will have to pay for the 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 uh, the deficit that's being created by the the fact that this tax cut will leave about a 1.4 trillion of, of you know hole in the budget. So yeah, but uh, the, Mnuchin says it's going to take care of itself. Yeah, this yeah, tax right, right, It's okay. going to pay for itself. <laughs> right. And he says it's it's the best thing because you have this trickle down effect. Right. So trickle down. This is very interesting. So trickle down theory. Right. It's been almost 100% disproven by, uh, by economists for a long time, it's been disproven. Trickle-down economics started in the 1920s uh, with a very conservative uh, kind of administration in the Coolidge administration where taxes were cut, the assumption, and their big businessmen um, were in charge of the administration uh, and uh, uh, the tax rates went down to about, after World War I, they were at almost 90% for the top bracket. Wow. Went down to 25% for the top bracket in the 1920s. And, uh, and the belief was that if you give the, the, uh, the, con those who control capital, you give them back uh, a large percentage of their money, then the money will trickle down to those at the bottom of the economy, and what happened in the 1920s is actually just the opposite. And uh, I think we have a slide here about the top 1% in uh, historically, and if we can bring that slide up, that would be great. Um, if, if we don't have it, it's no problem. But um, so, so by the time the 20s were done and the stock market crash happened, up almost 24% of the nation's wealth was held by the top 1%. Of of the uh, all of ramping up to 1929. That's correct. So what one so, inevitably has led to the conclusion had an effect on 1929. So, in other words, yes, it did in fact have an effect on 1929. In other words, trickle down economics in the 1920s led to the accumulation of wealth at the top. It did not trickle down, and so you had this a uh, problem in the economy with the, the poor getting poorer and the rich getting richer. So the crash and the depression. And the crash and the depression. So this were, is dangerous business, trickle-down economics. It is dangerous business. The crash and the depression were caused in part by this accumulation of wealth at the top because people at the top, very few individuals controlled a lot of the wealth and uh, they, would, they were volatile in their investments and in their in uh, the, the way they handle their stock. So has anything changed to make the, that formula different today? Well, the, the, uh, 
uh, the crash, and of course, in the Great Depression, led to vast increases in taxes on wealthy people. The tax, the tops tax rate, went up to 70 percent in the New Deal, and and then it went up to 94 percent in World War II. And so you had this. There it is. There's the uh, slide. So you can see in 1928, it's at about 24 percent. And then it goes down, down, down until in the 1960s and 70s, it's quite low at, at uh, 10 percent, the top 1 percent controlling 10 percent of the wealth. So, so th what happens after, uh, after the Great Depression and during World War II, then there's this great redistribution of tax money. Uh, the higher incomes are taxed more heavily, and that wealth is redistributed through the New Deal to those who have less or don't have anything at all through Social Security and and uh, uh, in other programs, other government programs. So, and Medicare eventually in the 1960s. So, so you had this redistribution of wealth that led to what you can see in the 1970s, led to a very kind of even distribution of wealth and a, and a, uh, a much uh, lower uh, percentage of wealth controlled by that top 1%. Isn't that the optimal to have a wide, a broad distribution well, of wealth? When, so, so yes, I think it is, and let me try to demonstrate that. So, so trickle-down economics doesn't work, but redistri redistributive economics does work because you can see in that graph that you had a more even distribution of wealth in the time period between, yeah. especially between the 1950s and the 1970s. Yeah, yeah. Between 1950 and 1970, about uh, the the working classes. Uh, doubled their income. In fact, most earners doubled their income with the with an economy that grew at about four to six percent. Uh, tax rates were moderate uh, for most individuals. The very wealthy paid more, but in fact, they didn't really pay the seventy percent rate because there were deductions. deductions that they could take. So, so in that time period, then you had this economy that was very stable, and you had uh, another way to look at this is uh, the top. Uh, the top executives earned about uh, uh, about uh, uh, about uh, four hundred percent of their uh, of their uh, of their of the average salary of their employees. But now that has exploded into you know it's it's more than a thousand percent. Uh, the, the top executives sure. earn millions as opposed and millions to the, and millions to the of average. Money they could never spend. That's correct. Yeah, this is the other thing about trickle-down economics is you're giving money to folks who are not going to spend that money because they have so much money already that they're, they're simply not going to spend more. So the problem with trickle-down economics, it does not spur growth. If you put money into the hands of those who need to spend it, the lower classes, you're going to have immediate they impacts. They will spend it, sure. Absolutely. And that so, builds the economy. Exactly, exactly. So, so it's the, the present, the, the tax package uh, that's proposed by the Republicans, and it looks like it's going to be passed very soon, mm. is it's wrong in several different ways. It's a, it's a solution in search of a problem, for one thing. <laughs> when you have these executives saying, hey, we don't need a tax cut. And the truth is corporate profits are at an all-time high. Yeah. In the United States, so so you've got that. You've got trickle-down theory, which doesn't work, uh, and uh, uh, and of course there's an attack on uh, the Affordable Care Act in this, um, which and, would exacerbate the same pro the same problem. It, it 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 attacks the poor. Exactly, exactly. So in the short run, uh, the lower classes might see a little bump up, right? But in the long run, after eight years. The tax cuts for the uh, for uh, the middle class and the lower classes actually expires. It's a lie. Then it's but a lie the, when they say the, the tax middle class. Cut, yeah, the tax cut for the the corporations is permanent. Oh, how could how could they do that? It's such a fantastic <laughs> lie. Yeah, it's so it's yeah it's it's uh, um, it's it. I don't think they're lying. I think they're uh, they're. Uh, they're they're moving off of an ideological assumption that trickle down economics, that capital, that putting the capital in the hands of those who already have a lot of capital will actually benefit yeah, the economy. But, but, but it's, having it's a flawed the, ideological having assumption. the middle class lose the, the tax tax yeah, reduction right, right. Uh, in a period of time, and having the rich guys and the corporations keep it permanently. Yeah. Oh, that's just yeah. really offensive. Yeah. So the question, you know, I think yeah. that the question to to talk about is. 
How did, how did this happen? How do we get into this place yeah. where people believe, I mean, I, I, don't, I doubt it's sincere with a lot of people, but people say they believe, um, you know, that it's better to have the wealthy wealthier. Uh, what is that yeah. from? Where does yeah. that come well, from? Uh, so, so there are a couple of things there. That, that, that idea is a very old idea uh, uh, in, Amer in American society, and that's this idea that anybody can become a millionaire. Um, <laughs> It's, it, it comes from a laudable kind of goal that uh, Americans believe that upward mobility is the possibility of every citizen. So uh, and this is really, it's uh, a Jeffersonian, it's Lincoln-esque. Uh, Lincoln believed in upward mobility. He talked a lot about upward mobility in, in his speeches. And the Republican Party of the, of the Civil War era was a party devoted to upward mobility. They passed the Homestead Act in... Uh, to give land away in the West to so homesteaders, sure. to, to, yeah, to propel uh, these Westerners into wealth. So this idea of upward mobility is a good idea. It's just that it has limits, okay? It, it has limits, and uh, it's been kind of uh, corrupted into this idea that those who have tremendous wealth should be rewarded further. So it's been kind of distorted in the in the contemporary. Well, it sounds scene. it sounds like a robber baron kind of thing because yeah. you know in, in the days of the robber barons, the robber barons controlled the government, yeah. and they yeah. and they acted for their own interests for their own, and that's what's happening now. Well, too, unfortunately, there there's some truth to that that we've moved we've moved away from uh, caps on uh, on uh, uh, campaign donations and and so yeah, wealthy people have a lot more influence on, in our elections now than they did previously. And it does, in some ways, uh, match the late 19th century, the Gilded Age, and the robber barons. Yes, there's, there are definitely some similarities there. Um, the, the, today, uh, corporations don't have quite the control over Congress that they did in the 1890s, where the large corporations actually controlled the, the senators from the states where they had their headquarters. So, so it's not quite that bad. But... The, th the thing, uh, the other thing about uh, the situation that we're in is that I think it results from the workings, the basic workings of, of a capitalist economy. And in a capitalist economy, over time, uh, if the government does nothing to prevent it, those who have capital will accrete capital. They will get more capital uh, in a capitalist economy. Um, so uh, those who control land, and control other assets like this are going to uh, see more appreciation than those who are simply wage earners. Wage earners mm -hmm. simply do not get the increases in capital mm -hmm. the way that those who control the corporations. Rich get richer. Yeah, yeah. And so, so what the government did in after the Great Depression or during the Great Depression in the 1930s in the New Deal is say, wait a minute, we're going to change the way that works in our economy. We're going to put a, a limitation on on this, and so we're going to redistribute uh, the results of capitalism, and and it worked. It worked. I mean, you you look at the American con economy from uh, the end of World War II until uh, Ronald Reagan. It's the most stable time period in the history of the American economy. And, and egalitarian. And yes, and it's the most kind of uh, balanced. The, the in common terms man of, could actually survive and, and and get to the middle class and actually prosper. We had yeah. millions of Americans moving into the middle class, buying homes for the first time, uh, moving into suburbs. Uh, yeah, it was a tremendously prosperous time, but. But if we go forward, and I, I'm not sure the Republicans understand this part. I think they understand that they want to, uh, their uh, philosophy of limiting government more, they want to get rid of as much taxation as possible. They don't want to pay for their brothers. They want to pay for social safety that, net that's for the right. less advantaged. That's right. That's right. And, and you could say that uh, this, the social safety net is next with, with this particular Congress because there's going to be a hole in the budget, and how are they going to fix that hole? Well, they're going to try to cut, cut, cut Social spending. Security and, yeah. and Medicare yeah, and Medicaid. Yeah. Yeah, Let's take a break, John. Yeah. We come back, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about inflation, too. Yes. We're going to talk about a hole in the budget yes. and, yeah. and what the historical background is for right. those kinds of things. Right. That's John David and history professor at HPU. We're talking about through the lens of history uh, here on... Uh, on Think Tech, and we're talking today about the history of taxes with John. We'll be right back for more. Aloha kakou. I am Andrea. 
I am from Italy, and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there, right now, using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talents Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future. Starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Strong man to come in and... Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were talking during the break about, you know, what happens if the Republicans keep on doing this. Yeah. And, and one of the uh, interesting issues is that the estate tax is going away. Right. In this tax right. reform, I can't say it without quotes, <laughs> tax reform bill, it's not really reform at all. Yeah. Uh, it's a grab, a huge grab, yeah. an, an immoral, uh, unjust, yeah. unethical grab on the part of one party driven by all the wrong motivations. Right. Anyway, you have no estate tax. You have lower income tax for, uh, low, relatively speaking, for the for the rich. Yeah. You have the lower corporate tax owned by the rich, controlled right. by the rich, right. uh, and of course we have Citizens United, which makes the rich more powerful yeah. uh, in electing yeah. elected officials. Yeah, so over time, you know, this is really interesting. Over time, it might work for them in the short term, but if you have a you know a large population that's getting poorer while right. you're getting richer. Right. You have the makings of the end of democracy. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, it's it's a disturbing trend. Although we reversed it uh, in, are we on? We're on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, back on. So uh, if you can reverse this, though, I mean, this this was the same situation in 1929, where you had this tremendous wealth in the hands of few and many more who were uh, poorer. Uh, the, the, the New Deal reversed that, and it was a people's revolution. So you can have the same thing here. The thing about the Republicans is I don't think they understand that they have laid the seeds for a potential social and even political revolution with these ideas. Because if, if again, as we were talking about, if you have um, just a few extremely wealthy people who are all, also have become politically powerful, then... It's a recipe for great unrest in the lower classes. It's also a recipe for a, a strong man coming in, yeah. claiming in the name of the people to yeah. take a sure. great deal of power and, and, uh, and perhaps doing it. So, so I don't think our democracy is threatened yet. But it could be. But it, but it could be in the this is the, the direction is all a threat. <clears throat> I remember the whole, the whole thing about uh, Ben Franklin and the woman's waiting outside Liberty Hall. Right. And what kind of governor are we going to have, Dr. Franklin? And he says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Yes. And it's fragile. People yeah. think it's, you know, it's got such well, depth that, it, it, you know, it's never, it's fragile. And I think this <laughs> kind of thing, attacks, and, and, you know, you talk about a strong man. A strong man is not democracy. It's something else. Right. I, I guess I would, we could debate about whether it's fragile. I think, actually, looking historically at the history of our republic and our democracy, okay, we're still a flawed democracy. But our Republican country has been quite durable, and we've gone through many crises and, and have survived them. So, Knock um, wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's concerning, but the, there is a piece of good news in the midst of all of this, and What's that's that? that the tax plan has a popularity rating of about 33%. Yeah. So the majority of Americans actually understand what's going on. Yeah. I think in a way uh, the... Uh, the Having uh, Trump having won and the Republicans having gotten control and pushing forward their agenda, I think it's really awoken the American people to the consequences of these ideas. And so I have a hard time seeing that this tax plan, if, even if it's implemented, <clears throat> will be able to stay in place over a long period of time. Well, um, there's an election uh, every November or two. And there's one coming up, and we've seen sort of a forerunner of that in Alabama. So maybe there'll be a whole, and we'll have a, what did you call yeah. it, a, a sort of a, a legislative social revolution yeah. Yeah. of sorts, yeah. as we, as we did in the New Deal. That's right. We, we could push it in the other direction. Um, and yeah, and, and, and we could see maybe um, 
uh, greater health care or even universal health care come out of this? Um, it's really hard to know, but um, I, I think it's, it's not a moment of despair, actually. Okay. I think uh, I'm seeing signs that, you know, the other thing about this is that the Republicans are quite divided, and uh, let's see if they can actually pass this tax package. But history shows us that uh, capital, if, if left untouched by governments, will accrete will accumulate to those who have a lot of capital. Especially without an estate tax. If I, reg if I make Uku bucks, um, you know, uh, w without, uh, w with lower tax rates for right. me and my right. corporation, uh, and then I'm able to pass that on to next generation without yeah. any tax burden at yeah. all, yeah. Then, then I'm creating a kind of royalty, am I not? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's I think, um, hopefully they'll leave at least some level of the uh, the real the the estate tax the inheritance tax in the, in this combined proposal I don't know honestly if they've left it in okay. or not I know they changed it they raised it we should talk about but... fiscal for a minute yeah yeah and so there's two elements right. of the fiscal maybe they're both connected one is uh, you know you have 1.5 trillion dollars that you're not collecting right. theoretically you're leaving it for spending right and a lot of uh, economists and political scientists would say this leads directly to inflation. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the history of that? What's the possibility? Right. So, uh, so inflation is, it, it, it's a, this is a much trickier issue uh, in history. When you look at the late 20s in terms of inflation, for the United States, it's uh, moderate. It's in the 45 to 5% uh, 5 uh, range. But uh, so, so that kind of spending at the top did not right away create inflation but there are other things going uh, there are other things going on the rest of the world is is beginning to go into the great depression earlier than the united states now yes yeah, so, well right so by in the mid 1920s the british economy is suffering greatly uh, they're in a deep recession throughout much of the 1920s over 10% unemployment um, mm -hmm. They're, pursu they're pursuing something else in there. They're, they're trying to get themselves back on the gold After standard. After the war. Yes, with a very, and they've set their interest rates very high, and it just, it just uh, stamps out any economic activity. So in the United States, part of the reason why the interest rate stays low is that capital goes abroad uh, because the British have high interest rates. Then the major capitalists who are benefiting from low taxes and an, and a, an economy that's robust and a stock market that's going stock market that's going up and up they send their money to great britain which actually has a bad impact on the united states in 1928 and 29 as it takes capital that would have been available mm -hmm. for investment in the stock market it begins to pull that out and uh, and then the stock, this is the amazing part, okay. The stock market begins to crash in 1929, and what does the government do? They raise, the Federal Reserve raises interest rates up to 6%, and it pushes the economy into a deep depression. It's 180 wrong. It's totally wrong at that point. So, uh, but it, it's possible that, uh, so the, the 1920s comparison doesn't necessarily pan out. Um, it, it's, it's possible that this could create inflation, um, but right now inflation is really under control because uh, we've had a slow growth economy and the Federal Reserve has been very careful about riding on top of inflation by raising interest rates. And they're apparently doing that. Yeah, and they, they have done it several times. They've done it three times this year and they're planning on doing it some more next year. So they're, they're riding inflation. I think that's, that's a good thing. Um, but if, if we get uh, a big, you know, I mean, it, it's possible that you could have much increased inflation, in which case you'll end up with a recession yeah. or maybe even a depression. The other fiscal point, the other fiscal point you mentioned earlier is you, if, you, if you don't collect taxes, if you reduce taxes, you, right. you don't have so many collections. And it's the same number, $1.5 trillion is right. not being collected. Right. So, A, I mean, how are you going to fund uh, Trump's $54 billion increase in military, right. which he's very ardent about? Right, right. Uh, how are you going to do his infrastructure that he talked about, yeah, yeah. and including the Beschlugan Wall there on yes, Mexico, yes. I mean, the, well, out of I, American I, funds? I, I, the, so their idea with infrastructure is to farm it out to private companies. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to. How are they going to make I, a buck on that? I don't think the Republican Party is actually going to support uh, infrastructure investments. Yeah, right. I don't think they're going to do so it. So that campaign promise is going to go I, nowhere. I think so, yeah. I think that's... And then you that's... mentioned the social safety net, which yeah. costs plenty of money. 
Yes. Uh, including, of course, health care uh, from right. the government. Right. And all kinds of other social safety net things that we need to, you know, keep our population alive and reasonably functioning. Uh, that's probably going to get cut. I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, so I mean, it, what it, kind of effect do we have? Well, when I, you I do don't that? see. This is where I don't think politically the Republicans will be able to do that. And if they try it, they're going to get pushed out of office very quickly. Yeah. I mean, we have elections every two years. Yeah. And, and the Thank Congress. goodness for that. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, but back to inflation, there's, there is one other thing that I didn't mention, and that's if you put a hole in the, in the, in the budget and in the deficit, you're going to have to borrow much more money to fill that hole. And when you borrow money, you're going to have to pay higher interest rates on the bonds, and that produces inflation. Yeah. Uh, so that's the other part. I mean, we could, we could see an inflationary spiral. Housing is already probably at a bubble stage in the United States. In prices. If housing prices are nearing a bubble stage so um, <clears throat> it could be that this uh, pardon me that this tax bill if it becomes law could be the thing that pushes us into a recession or even a depression let's hope not uh, but yeah I, th I think that's uh, that's a distinct possibility well you know when the government lies on a regular basis <laughs> and deceives us on a regular basis it's yeah. also lying to itself that's right. And it's right. not operating on, on facts. So That's right. it could be a huge mistake, uh, such as raising the interest rate in 1929. It, it could. Uh, it could. And it yes. could. What he's doing now, what they're doing now, could push us into recession it, it or could. worse. Yes. So what's the good news, John? Well, I, I do think the, the good news here is political, that uh, most Americans don't support this tax package. And I think the, re the Democrats, I assume, will run on the basis of this in the midterm elections. And I think it's quite possible that the Republicans will get crushed in the midterm elections. And then the Democrats are going to have to <clears throat> figure out how they can work with the Trump administration, or if not, they're gonna to have to figure out how to kind of uh, make this into, uh, uh, parlay this into a situation where they can reverse some of this stuff. I, you know, I mean, that, that's hard to predict. You talked about the but, robber barons and, and the big trusts of the early uh, yeah. what, the 20th century, that's late right. 19th century. And, and luckily, I mean, happily, thank God, you yeah. know, we were able to beat that back and have a democratic society and, and the changes that had to be made were made. Um, but the problem is that, um, that every change, and I know this from, um, what's his name, Balkan, Jack Balkan teaches constitutional law at Yale, as he, you know, even in a bad administration, you make a mistake, you, you go the wrong way. Yeah. It's not like it, you can wind it back like a yo-yo. For example, if the, if the Republicans are able to pass this bill in the next few yeah. days, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not like a new election will allow a new group of legislators to immediately, you know, wind it back like a yo-yo. Right, right. Uh, you got to really work at that. Take a hundred years or, yeah. well, a long uh, time anyway. I, I, I don't, well, it depends on what happens with the economy. If the economy does overheat and you get a recession, then I think it happens quite quickly. You get a turnover in Congress, and then in 2020, you get a turnover in the presidency. And then you can, then you can uh, like I say, this, this presents opportunities as well if, if, if you can turn it in that direction, like what happened in the Great Depression and in the New Deal. So um, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, we've had... Uh, many, many tax reforms in the 20th century. The top rate has gone from 7% to 94% to 25% to 99% during World War II to 70% uh, after World War II to 39% uh, during the, the Reagan era. There's no rhyme or reason. 35%. It's <laughs> now it's 39 and a half. It'll go down to 37 with this package. So there's been a lot of change in and what it suggests is that taxes are incredibly political. Yeah. That you yeah. get it. So I think change is quite possible. There's, there's uh, I mean, the thing is, corporate executives are going on TV and saying, you know, we don't need this. We don't really need this at all. So I think there's a good argument to me made that uh, none of this will be permanent in the long yeah. run. Well, one thing is clear, you know, if you, if you <laughs> thought... That the study of history was something dusty for the back yeah. shelf, you're wrong. <laughs> that's totally right. And in that's fact, true. it's moving. Isn't it true? It's moving faster now. I Absolutely. mean, you got to read the paper every day. you got to see what's going on. Absolutely. History is happening around us. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, with the economy as well, as well as with American society, yeah, it's very important to understand this stuff. Yeah. yeah.
very yeah. important that you come on the show and talk about yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you, John. John sure. David and HPU history professor. You're on history lens on yes. today. <laughs> Thank you.